Good afternoon, everyone. The first item of business this afternoon is a statement by Fergus Ewing on oil and gas. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. Mr Ewing, ten minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The oil and gas industry has been, is now, and will continue to be an enormous asset to Scotland. It has contributed over £300 billion in tax revenues to the UK, and it has turned Aberdeen into a global hub of innovation and engineering ingenuity. With fields such as Clare and Mariner expecting to be still producing beyond 2050, the sector will continue to operate for decades to come. While the North Sea is a mature basin, there are also frontier regions such as west of Shetland with huge prospects and a diverse range of development opportunities. But the current fiscal regime is a barrier to this development. In 2011, I asked industry and academia to help devise a modern oil and gas strategy. That strategy set out a clear vision for the industry's long-term future and set priorities for future action. It has guided this government in its actions for its ongoing support to the industry. Let me summarise the progress made. First, on enterprise, Scottish enterprise has already achieved the target set in the strategy to engage with an additional 100 oil and gas companies for account management in the period of 2012 to 2015. They now have 344 oil and gas companies within its account management portfolio. In addition, HIE account manage over 50 companies. Second, on innovation. Working with industry leaders such as Paul DeLoe and Ian Phillips and with Albert Roger, Professor Albert Roger of Aberdeen University, we launched the Oil and Gas Innovation Centre, presiding officer, in November last year. The centre has funding of £10 million over five years. It is already up and running, developing and delivering solutions to the key challenges faced by businesses. Thirdly, on internationalisation. Scotland's oil and gas supply chain is an international success story. Total international sales grew to £10,000 million. That's not £10 million, it's £10,000 million in 2012 13 an increase of 22% on the previous year. International activity uh, now accounts for just over half of the total oil and gas supply chain sales. Scotland is now an international hub for oil field services. For example, we have led the way in areas such as subsea safety, integrity and supply chain management, giving us a significant competitive industrial advantage. I have led two trade missions to Houston and I am confident that due to the support of SDI, SE and HIE, that our supply chain companies are well placed to capture new high value activity. Fourthly, we continue to support skills development in the sector. Scottish Government, Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council are all working with OPITO and the industry to deliver the immediate and long term skill needs of the sector. Progress has been made with the establishment of Energy Skills Scotland and the publication of the Energy Skills Investment Plan which is currently being refreshed and will be published in the coming weeks, taking account of the recent Ernst & Young report, Fueling the Next Generation, and identifying key actions to be taken forward collaboratively by industry, academia and government. Fifth, on infrastructure, the Scottish Government is targeting investment in local infrastructure in the Aberdeen area, city and shire. For example, the £745 million project to upgrade the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route will benefit communities, business and, presiding officer, remove a serious impediment to economic growth in the area. Sixth, on decommissioning, we are committed to supporting infrastructure that will help offshore activity. For example, this government and our agencies contributed £2.5 million to the near £12 million Quayside project at Dales Vaux South, this will enable Shetland to become a leading decommissioning hub. Presiding officer, I've summarised some of the measures this government has taken. We are making the best use of our devolved powers. However, we continue to examine every further way in which we can possibly do more. However, it is crystal clear that it is 
the fiscal regime that needs to change. The responsibility for that rests with the UK Government, and it is to that that I now turn. We have consistently called for a competitive, predictable and stable fiscal regime. In 2011, we published proposals, including the introduction of an investment allowance to help mitigate the Chancellor's shock tax grab, raising the supplementary charge from 20% to 32%. In 2013, we published Maximising the Returns for Oil and Gas in an Independent Scotland, setting out the approach we would take to stewardship. Following publication of Sir Ian Wood's interim report uh, in 2013 and final report in 2014, we made clear our full support for his recommendations and including that a shadow body should be set up immediately. That did not happen. We commissioned an independent expert commission to consider how best to maximise the value from the sector. They recommended government consider the total contribution made to the economy and society by the industry, the total value added. I sent the Fiscal Commission's recommendations to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Today we have published a paper setting out the fiscal changes that we believe are necessary to support investment, encourage exploration and ensure that the North Sea is a competitive investment location. This reflects the range of challenges such as declining production efficiency, rising costs and premature cessation of production. Firstly, we are calling for an investment allowance as recommended previously by the Scottish Government in 2011 and the Expert Commission in 2014. This will simplify the fiscal regime and potentially boost investment by between 20 and £37,000 million. Secondly, we are calling for a phased reversal of the increase in the supplementary charge alongside a clear timetable to provide clarity for investors. This will provide a strong signal to investors that the North Sea is open for business. This could encourage over £7 billion, £7,000 million of investment. Scottish Government analysis based on industry data shows that these measures, presiding officer, can potentially support up to 26,000 and 5,600 jobs respectively. Thirdly, we are calling for an exploration tax credit. Exploration, presiding officer, is already at an historically low level and failure to address this will mean that we do not maximise the economic recovery of oil from the North Sea. We will now consult with stakeholders on these proposals. But in conclusion, let me be clear. Speedy action from the UK Government on these areas is vital. Put simply, presiding officer, these measures must be delivered in the budget this March. There is a long-term sustainable future for the North Sea, and we are committed to using every lever at our disposal here in the Scottish Government. It is time, signing off, sir, for the UK Government to follow suit. Many thanks. And the Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions. Uh, so it would be helpful if members who wish to speak and uh, ask questions would press the request to speak buttons now. We are extraordinarily tight for time this afternoon, so short questions and short answers would allow us to get everyone in, hopefully. Question 1, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. I thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement. When Jim Murphy and I met Oil and Gas UK in Aberdeen on Tuesday, they told us that 2,000 jobs had already gone that many thousands more were at risk. The word crisis was used at meeting after meeting with operators, service companies, trade unions and local government. Yet there is little sense in the Minister's statement of the potential crisis that we face. There are many things we can agree with, but there is almost nothing uh, that is new. The price of oil is almost, has fallen by half over the last few months. It is now slipping below $50 a barrel. This is a new uh, feature of the issues facing 
the oil industry and it must be a new future of the government's response. We cannot simply have business as usual. Mr Ewing has published an assessment today of the fiscal impact of changes in the tax regime at Westminster, but we have not yet seen or heard the Scottish Government's assessment of the impact of the falling, falling price of oil on the Scottish economy. Can you now tell us what assessment he has set in train of the impact of $50 oil on jobs and businesses in the Scottish economy? Will he tell us whether he intends to assess the potential impact of $40 oil on jobs and business in the Scottish economy? He has said today that he will examine any, every further way in which the government can possibly do more, and I welcome that. Will he undertake to assess the value and the contribution of Scottish Labour's proposal for a resilience fund to help industry in exceptional circumstances like these? I, I, I note from the SNP backbenches a sceptical response to that. I, I, I want to hear from the Minister, in the spirit of what Nicola Sturgeon told Kez Dugdale just before Christmas, that the SNP government is open to ideas from other parties. I don't want them laughing at the possibility of examining ideas from other parties as to how to save jobs and business in the Scottish uh, economy. And you must come it is to their question, duty, please. not just to say to Westminster what Mr Ewing thinks Westminster should do. It's their duty of the Scottish Government to provide proper stewardship for the Scottish economy, and that should start here today. Fergus Ewing. Um, well, perhaps if I can just start with the, the uh, uh, resilience fund, uh, which has been mentioned. First of all, um, I think it's reasonable to say that Mr Murphy did not say how much this fund should be. So it is as yet an unspecified sum uh, for unspecified beneficiaries from an unspecified source. But if it is the case that uh, Mr Murphy, in the little he has said about this fund thus far, is now a convert to an oil fund, then we welcome that conversion, no matter how late in the day. Um, it's important not to work ourselves up into a panic, presiding officer, as Mr Macdonald seem, in, seemed so intent on doing. And remember that Aberdeen, as he well knows, has been here before. The oil price has been low down to $10 in 1986, in 1999. More recently, in 2007 and 2009, it has also been low around the $40 to $50 mark. It does fluctuate. We have always said that. We have always recognized that. None of us here control the prices any more than any of us here have predicted the prices. If we did, we would all be multi-billionaires, would we not, presiding officer? But the fact is this, the fact is this, that uh, Labour had 13 years to set up an oil fund. Over that period, they had £93 billion of revenue from oil. £93 billion. That is three times as much as the annual Scottish Government budget. It's ten times as much as was spent in Iraq, and they didn't invest one bobby. Meanwhile, Norway, back in 1999, when oil was $10 a barrel, was just setting up its fund. How much is it worth now? around 540 billion pounds sterling. So there's a tale of two countries' stewardships of an, an enormous and invaluable asset, the poor stewardship from Labour and Conservative in successive governments, which has resulted in no oil fund, uh, and the successful stewardship of a smaller country, which has managed over that period to build up a fund which helps stabilise those figures. So I really do not think, with respect, that uh, this proposal can be taken too seriously, especially as Jackie Bailey has not signed up the proposal, uh, as, as the First Minister pointed out. She said uh, just in August this year, setting up an oil fund will take money from public services, <laughs> presiding officer. I think, what I think that's utter a sufficient shambles. answer for the time being, Mr Ewing. We are now five minutes into the 20 minutes allocated for this part of the afternoon. Short questions and answers, please. Mordo Fraser. Uh, thank you. Um, can I thank the uh, Minister for his statement and for advance sight of it, although, although I note that in over 1,000 words he did not once mention the fall in the oil price. We are all aware of the seriousness of the challenges facing the oil and gas sector and the economy of North East Scotland in particular. 
Those involved in the industry want to see Scotland's two governments working together on this issue to try and find practical ways to help those affected. What they, they did not want to hear today from the Minister was the repeat of his previous performances in this chamber, where all he did was grandstand and try and score political points against Westminster. Sadly, they will have been disappointed this afternoon. What we have here today is yet another example of a minister refusing to take responsibility and trying to pass the buck entirely to Westminster for action. That is not good enough. Presiding officer, the minister knows that we support the call for a new investment allowance being brought forward and that we have made this clear to our colleagues in the UK government. But what we want to know today is this. What is this minister and this government going to do themselves to help the industry because this statement is totally devoid of a single practical new help uh, to uh, help the uh, industry. Well, well, okay. Over the past 18 months, HIE has supported developments in 23 companies estimated to create over 1,000 jobs. SE has invested 9.7 million against total project costs of 68 million. We have over the past couple of years invested uh, around six and a half million in energy skills. We've invested 10 million pounds in innovation. Nearly 100,000 companies in Scotland receive our small business bonus. We work closely, ever more closely, with the universities and colleges involved in oil and gas. I myself, actually, Murdo Fraser, set up two joint meetings, jointly arranged between the Scottish Government and the UK Government, my, at my suggestion, to arrange sessions for small and medium-sized businesses in oil and gas to access finance. We did that without a fanfare of trumpets. We just did it. There was no publicity. There were hundreds of companies there, uh, and we believe many were helped. I've attended five pilot meetings uh, over the past three years. I work constructively as far as I can to the best of my ability with the UK government. But the trouble is this, uh, and this, I'm afraid, is what Mr. Fraser sadly doesn't seem to get, that it's not really us, just us, in the Scottish government that are saying that the urgent and pressing need is for the fiscal changes that are urgently required to tackle exploration at an all-time low, to tackle the desperate need to instill and reinstill confidence in the industry. It's the industry itself. So Malcolm Webb says, quotes, we have experienced repeated and increasingly aggressive tax hits all of this has, quotes, weakened the international competitiveness and resilience of the industry. I've met over 110 oil and gas companies in and around Aberdeen over a period of 57 days, which I've spent over the past three and a half years in Aberdeen. I can, in conclusion, presiding officer, tell you beyond any shadow of doubt that the clear consensus amongst almost every business in Aberdeen is that these tax changes to bring back exploration as Norway has done, to reinstill confidence in the UK, to undo the damage of the Danny Alexander tax, the Danny tax in 2011, these are what the industry wants, they are what they need, and they need it this March. Thank you very much. Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, companies have told Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce that the current fiscal regime is unpredictable, unnecessarily complex and simply too burdensome. Jeremy Creswell, the Press and Journal's energy editor, has said today that the London government doesn't grasp the immense strategic value of our offshore oil and gas resource. Does the Minister agree that in order to help the oil and gas industry, the, tra the Chancellor should follow Mr Creswell's advice to get a move on and slash the tax burden now. Fergus Ewing. Um, well, I, I do, and I pay tribute to Aberdeen Chamber of Commerce. I'm reminded by my office that I met with them formally on the 8th of February 2013, but I've also met, met with them and their members on many, many occasions. And indeed to the Press and Journal, whose coverage of the oil and gas industry in Scotland is, uh, is second to none. Uh, and it simply is not a matter of party political claim and counterclaim. It is just a matter of fact yeah. that what the industry now needs, uh, and now by this March budget, is implementation of the tax changes <coughs> which are necessary to help address the very serious predicament which the industry now faces. 
very much. Jackie Bailey. Presiding officer, there is nothing new in this statement. Not one action that has changed or appeared since the dramatic foil, uh, fall in oil prices in the last few months. So let me, let me ask the minister again about the risk of job losses. And I hope he treats the question more seriously than the first minister did. Spice estimate 15,750 job losses. That's one in 12 jobs in the industry on a scale that is worse than the closure of Ravenscraig. Given the price is now below $50 a barrel, what will the Scottish Government do to help ensure we don't risk those jobs? Minister. Well, if, if Jackie Bailey has read the Ernst & Young report on fueling the next generation, she will also be aware that between this year and the end of this decade, uh, there are also between 10 and 20,000 extra job opportunities and requirements for new entrants into the industry. This is a complex and fluid situation uh, and therefore we are working with the industry and with academia to ensure that the future recruitment requirements, especially of young people, are going to be met and that is clearly set out. If she had read the Oil and Gas UK report, presiding officer, she will see the large number of projects that are going in stream that will require people to work on and offshore and we are working with uh, with the industry, with Oil and Gas UK and with Subsea UK and with all the other uh, representative bodies to tackle their recruitment uh, needs. We will continue to do everything we possibly can to address the needs of both the industry and those people who face redundancy at this time. And that includes working with bodies such as Scottish Engineering and the manufacturing sector to see what opportunities there are for the traditional industries in the North East to uh, provide help for a solution in taking on young people. Of course, that is part of the solution. That is work we are doing. Yes, it is not you, because we've been doing it for the past three years. And, presiding officer, we will just carry on doing it. Thank you very much. Tavis Scott. Thank, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, can I thank the Minister for an advanced copy of his statement? Would he accept that the Chevrons west of Shetland Rosebank field wasn't sanctioned at $110 a barrel because the cost of production in the oil and gas industry has risen by 62% over the last four years? And that's one of the major factors that needs to be uh, confronted. Does Sir Ian Wood need to be called into action to uh, challenge that uh, issue? And would he also accept that, as well as writing to the energy companies, as the First Minister made clear he was doing uh, this morning, Morning. Would his government undertake to write to shipping companies and airlines such as Logan Air to make sure that the higher, the lower fuel bills they face will now be passed on in terms of lower ticket prices for those of us who use such services? Minister. Uh, yes, Tavi Scott is exactly right. I've, I have uh, spoken on numerous occasions. I met Chevron twice uh, and I've spoken with them uh, uh, on various occasions. And he's absolutely correct to say that the major Rosebank field, one of the largest fields that there will ever uh, B was not going to go ahead even before the oil price call, so, uh, uh, fall. So that is absolutely correct. He makes a reasonable point with regard to Logan Air. I will look into that with the Minister for Transport and see what action, if, if required, it, it, it needs uh, to uh, be uh, taken. Uh, and we will, of course, continue to work very closely with the likes of Sandra Lawrenson of Lerwick Port uh, Authority and with Murdo McKeever of Peterson SBS to continue the good work they're doing to exploit the opportunities from the excellent location that Lerwick uh, and Shetland has to do decommissioning. And we will also work with uh, shipping, he mentioned, with people like uh, Craig Shipping, Douglas Craig, who provides leadership in Aberdeen and opportunities to a great many young people. Um, and uh, I should also say, in conclusion, uh, I'm dealing with the the serious question about the real threat to many people's jobs is this. If we can bring in exploration tax credit or measures to do what Norway did in 2005, we can emulate their success, which saw a four-fold increase in exploration and appraisal drilling. Four-fold. After they introduced the tax breaks, there were four times as many dr drilling rigs as hitherto. That, presiding officer, is the way to tackle the jobs difficulties that we face. Thank you very much. We have nine questions left in five minutes. Alex Salmond. 
thank the Minister for detailing the six separate streams of action that have been taken by the Scottish Government and can ask him for an assurance that these uh, actions will be intensified as the need arises given the threat of job losses in the industry. But of the tax changes that he proposes, uh, can I commend the expiration tax credit, which he rightly said had a dramatic effect in Norway when it was introduced in 2005. Can he say how we can impress the urgency of, of this matter, uh, given the tendency of the Treasury to move like lightning, as in 2011 when prices were high, to increase tax, but to move at a snail's pace when prices are low, uh, to reduce the tax burden and to offer an incentive like the expiration credit, which would do a massive amount to protect and expand jobs now, but also to discover new fields for the future. Thank you. Fergus Ewing. Well, Alex Salmon is exactly right, and these points I will relay to the pilot meeting, which I'm attending on Tuesday next week, uh, uh, where I believe Mr Hancock, the Energy Minister, will attend, and I will put these points very clearly to him. Um, I think it's instructive to remember, Presiding Officer, that uh, as a result of the enlightened expiration tax credit policy in Norway with 78% uplift, I, uh, I believe, uh, they found some of the largest discoveries ever, like the Johann Sverdrup field. In fact, some of the discoveries were in the midst of existing fields, which they hadn't known to be there. So if they can do it in Norway, they can do it across the other side of the international boundary very well. And of course, the day rates of the, uh, of the rigs are at a lower level, far lower level than they were. So commercially, this is the right time to stimulate this activity. Uh, and therefore, I will be highlighting that the expiration tax credit measures are absolutely essential if we are to address the jobs challenge that Aberdeen and Scotland faces. It is absolutely essential. This is not delayed beyond March. If there's one message that I want to convey, it is that one. Thank you. Point made. Richard Baker. Given the significance of this issue for Aberdeen's economy, will the Minister agree that the proposal for an oil and gas summit made by Aberdeen City Council leader Jenny Leng is an important initiative? Will he and appropriate colleagues agree to attend? Uh, and also that governments now at every level must, must examine what more they can do to bring forward uh, new uh, vital infrastructure investment in Aberdeen? Minister. Uh, well, I've always sought to work very closely with uh, uh, representatives of Aberdeen Council in a number of ways, and uh, at my behest, I've, I've met with them on various occasions to address some of, some of these matters. Of course, we want to work extremely closely with uh, Aberdeen Council, and we will, uh, uh, we will seek continue to do so as we do all local authorities. Uh, I am extremely pleased that my colleague Shona Robinson has been able to announce the increase in the proportion of health, uh, health budget spending to the North East, something that I know is not my responsibility, but has been raised by North East members over a long, long period. Uh, uh, and uh, I would uh, remind Mr Baker that the commitment to the peripheral road in Aberdeen is not just another roads project. It's a project which will, in part, address the transport problems, the road transport problems, which, from my own observation of 57 days in Aberdeen over the past three and a half years, are the worst in Scotland. Let's not beat about the bush. And therefore, the support of the measure in Aberdeen that we are bringing forward, the Western Peripheral Road, at a cost of £745 million, one of the largest schemes in Scotland, is seen in Aberdeen Chamber of Commerce and across all circles, not just business people, as the key infrastructure change for that city. And I'm proud that it's an SNP government that's going to deliver it. Thank you. Dennis Robertson. Robertson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Minister, uh, Sir Ian Wood, uh, one of the world's leading experts in the industry, uh, uh, was encouraging in his report young people to seek um, uh, careers in the oil and gas sector. Does the Minister agree with me that they should continue to seek careers within the sector? Minister? Well, yes, I do, and I pay tribute to the work that Sir Ian Wood has done in the Youth Commission, working with Angela Constance. Uh, and I was struck by the the passion and determination and knowledge that he brought to that task, and that work is being taken forward by colleagues. And I would also point out, uh, since Dennis Robertson has mentioned Sir Ian Wood, that if you look at what Sir Ian said most recently, he said that he expected, as I think do uh, most leading commentators, that the oil price will recover. He said, I believe, towards the end of uh, this year and the beginning of next year. 
Uh, and the OPEC itself, presiding officer, has predicted that the oil price will recover to around $110 per barrel and in the long term, $100 a barrel. Presiding officer, Aberdeen has been here before. It's big enough and strong enough to survive. What it needs is the support from the UK government that it has never had. Thank you very much. Duncan McNeill. Thank you, President Officer. As we've heard over the piece um, today as well, that there may be an inevitability about cost-cutting on the jobs and earnings of Scotland's offshore workforce. And I anticipate that the Minister will readily agree that whatever the pressures of cost-cutting bring, it should not extend to cuts in health and safety. We would forget Piper Alpha and the 167 dead, five from my own constituency, at our peril. Can the Minister give a commitment that, there, that he will bring together trade unions, contractors, operators and indeed the health and safety executive to confirm categorically, whatever the pressures that befall the oil industry, that there will be no compromise in the safety of the offshore workforce? Minister. Well, I think Mr McNeill makes an absolutely important and valid point. Of course, uh, the standards of safety apply irrespective of what the oil price is. They must be of the highest order. In response to his question about working with trade unions, I meet regularly with trade unions. I met with several trade union representatives in the uh, last parliamentary week before the Christmas period. Uh, as a result of that, we agreed to do further work in engagement with the health and safety executive. The standards which apply are extremely high, but we need to be constantly vigilant in Scotland. Uh, and I would point out as well in conclusion, presiding officer, that some of the key areas of specialism and small businesses uh, and skilled workforce are actually operating in exporting our standards of skills to many other parts of this world. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government has again called for a competitive, predictable and stable fiscal regime. Uh, does the Minister agree with me that, in fact, reckless decisions by UK governments over the years, like the supplementary charge hike in 2011, have, in fact, damaged prospects of the oil and gas industry? And does he agree with me that devolving powers over the North Sea fiscal regime to Scotland would, in fact, deliver the best outcome for both the industry and public finances. Briefly, if you would, please, Minister. Well, one particular company, uh, whose name I won't mention, described the 2011 Danny Allingson tax, tax increase as, quotes, expropriation. And just before Christmas, another leading company in Aberdeen said the UK has, quotes, the worst tax regime in the world. Yep. Now, signing officer, colleagues in the UK parties representing this place may think this is politics. This is what the industry says. This is what the industry thinks. That is wrong. We need confidence to get the jobs back. We need to win back the confidence the way I've set out with the expiration tax credits, the investment allowance, and a phased reversal of the Danny Alexander tax hike in 2011 is quite simply what the industry wants, what it needs, and what it deserves in March this year. Many thanks. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Yet another discussion of fossil fuels without the words carbon or climate being so much as uttered. And this just one day after yet more evidence, this time from UCL, demonstrating again that the bulk of the world's fossil fuels must be unburnable if we're remotely serious about climate change. How can the Minister fail to acknowledge the vulnerability of a Scottish economy overexposed to the carbon bubble. How can he want to just get back to business as usual when business as usual is what brought us to this perilous position? Minister. Um, well, I strongly suspect that uh, Mr Harvey and myself are not going to see eye to eye in all of these matters, presiding officer. Uh, I do respect his position, though, but I do not agree with it. And I would just point out one simple fact, that the opportunity for us to meet the carbon emission targets can only be achieved if uh, we are able to deal with the carbon emissions and store them. Carbon capture and storage is the only means by which this can be achieved according to the International Energy Authority. The depleted oil fields in the North Sea are the only place where that carbon can be stored, and therefore the opportunity for carbon capture and storage in the North Sea, combined with enhanced oil recovery, is actually, in one sense, the greenest policy of them all. Thank you. And finally, Mark MacDonald. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, this morning, Mike Tholan, Oil and Gas UK's Economic Director, told BBC Radio Scotland that the single biggest beneficiary of high oil, high oil prices has been the UK Government because more than 60 per cent of profits go to them in taxation. Does the Minister agree that, given the vast benefit over the decades, uh, it is vital the UK Government puts in place the fiscal regime to ensure that the industry remains strong? Minister. Well, I, I do appreciate what Mark Macdonald says, and sadly, it just has been the case that the oil and gas industry in Scotland has been regarded as by the UK Treasuries of whatever hue as a kind of gigantic cash machine instead of an excellent industry. That mindset, that approach, that attitude too must change. Many thanks and my apologies to the several speakers who have been unable to call this afternoon. We must now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 119.